All right, uh, hi everybody. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo and welcome to Matt Ju's thesis defense. So there's two reasons to celebrate today. And it's always a very momentous and exciting day when uh, someone's graduating uh, from the ichthyology lab. And so just a few things before we start, it's just a reminder to please uh, keep yourself uh, muted and keep your video, well, you can have it on, but uh, during the talk, so stay muted and then and don't try to share your screen or anything like that. And then at the end of the talk, there'll be an, uh, an opportunity to ask questions live to Matt. And so if you'd like to ask a question uh, under the reactions tab, usually at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, there will be the raise hand feature. So if you click on that, uh, that'll show a little, little hand next to your face and then that will alert us and I'll be able to call on you and then you'll be asked to unmute yourself. And at that point, you could also turn on your video and you can ask Matt the question. All right, so what I'll do is just a short little introduction and then we'll let Matt uh, get going. So uh, just a little bit about Matt's background, All right? So he has a number of really nice academic accomplishments. So before coming to Moss Landing, he did his undergraduate degree at CSU Monterey Bay. And there he did a double major, which is really impressive. So he got a BS in marine science and also in mathematics. And both of those things have really propelled him uh, in this career and in what he was doing in his thesis. But also helped him because he has allowed him to become a lecturer at CSU. And so that's one way he's kind of paid his way through grad school. And you know, many graduate students have the opportunity to be a teaching assistant, you know, in a course, but very few have the opportunity to actually be the lecturer, to be the instructor of record and to teach the course themselves. And so Matt's done that basically the entire time he's been here at Moss Landing. So uh, he's been teaching at CSUMB. He's taught a lot of courses in the math department, uh, pre-calculus, calculus, you know, algebra. These are just a few examples of the of the different courses he's taught. And then most recently in the marine science department, he taught it this course, Adventures in Marine Science for some of the new marine science majors uh, in the program. Uh, he's received some awards uh, that have helped to pay for different aspects of his thesis research, like the staple isotope component of his thesis that you hear about. So we got the Myers Oceanographic uh, uh, Trust Grant. Uh, he's also been quite involved in, in doing some professional service. And so for that, he served as a reviewer for the IUCN, which is the International Union conservation of nature. And here he's, he's helped with some of the red list assessments. So evaluating whether species are endangered or vulnerable, kind of what the risk level is uh, uh, for, for some of the sharks and rays and species that he's been interested in studying. And then he's also been a mentor. And uh, so there's three students in particular uh, that have interned with him and have helped on his projects through both the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Center program at CSU Monterey Bay and the Coast Scholars and Training program. And you can see as well there in the photo, uh, of him, you know, really he enjoys education and they're teaching some kids about sharks at the Moss Landing Open House event. Right, so if you know Matt, right, he has a sense of awe and wonder about how the natural world works. And you can see that's really carried through his entire life. He's pretty much had that same expression of just wonderment, you know, for the last 25 to 30 years or so. And uh, that's kind of really propelled him to, to, to really asking, you know, really interesting questions about what's happening uh, in marine science. And so he'll be telling you later about the thesis work that he did studying the diets and the potential for competition between two deep sea uh, species of cat sharks. But there's a number of other- you should, uh, uh, you should check your sources there, Scott, go back. Yeah? Yeah, that's not even me. Which, this one, the little kid? No, the one on the right, that's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> that's not even me. Well, he looks really similar. <laughs> Your mom must have gotten you confused. <laughs> so he's had a number of other significant uh, research experiences. Uh, and so here are a few, few examples. So uh, he's uh, published the uh, lead author a uh, publication recently in the journal Marine Biodiversity. So here, uh, the redescription of the big eye chimera. Uh, so he's both has skills in uh, systematics and taxonomy as well as genetics. So he started this work when he was an undergrad working with Dave Ebert and the Pacific Shark Research Center group here at Moss Landing. And there's a number of the, the alums from that group that are, that are on that publication. Uh, he also participated in uh, for a number of different years in NOAA groundfish trawl surveys. So that was one way he was able to obtain some of the specimens for his thesis. 
uh, but it was also this really important annual survey that is used to inform fisheries management and to do stock assessments. And so he spent you know, a number of weeks each year on these cruises up and down the coast uh, doing these collections. Uh, after his undergraduate, he spent a little bit of time in Australia during the summer, uh, uh, working in Shark Bay in Western Australia, uh, trying to understand uh, how the ecosystem was functioning there and working with some researchers. So he was tagging turtles and sharks and doing dive surveys and all sorts of interesting things. Uh, he also took two classes with me at Moss Landing. And uh, in both of those classes, he seems to have, I still don't really understand it, but this weird fascination with this species called the leather star, as you can see in that picture on the lower right. And in, uh, so he did two different class projects trying to understand uh, different aspects of the ecology of that species, looking at its diet and its microhabitat preferences and, and other things. All right, Matt, right, sports have always been a big part of Matt's life. So ever since he was young, right, he's always had a baseball in his hand or he's been playing basketball. Right there, I wouldn't want to have come across him on the football field, man, he, he would have taken me out, I'm sure there. And then, you know, as he's gotten a little more senior, right, some more leisure sports, golf, and well, you can see in that volleyball photo now, he's mostly just, just modeling different fashion trends on the volleyball court. He also, uh, as of late, has taken to a number of snow sports and snow, snowboarding in particular. And you might be asking yourself, well, how did he end up here uh, in the snow and well I have some evidence to show you how this happened and so here I think he might have been trying out for the Olympics I'm not quite sure well oh, oops well that at least he's great he's a great scientist and has that to fall back on uh, if he doesn't make the Olympics here in 2022 all right, Matt as well, he, val he values being well rested. That's how he stays such a hard worker and keeps that, keeps that brain working, right? So even from a young child, right, he always stayed well rested, but even currently as a grad student, you know, he found ways in the lab, right, to recharge the brain. You know, it could have been in his chair, right? On the lab bench where people do dissections, you know, even in the computer lab. And, you know, when you're looking at Matt and you're seeing him sleeping and resting, and the only thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, he is just so angelic in the way uh, that he sleeps there. Right, he's also always prepared. So here's some good evidence that, you know, decades ago, he was training for the COVID pandemic, wearing those face coverings, right, protecting himself and staying safe. Right, if you know Matt as well, you know, he values the good things in life, good food, drink, spending time with friends, He's always got a smile on his face, always has a big laugh. And I guess hanging out with his brother too, right? <laughs> he also knows how to strike a pose. All right, if science doesn't work out, modeling could be another career. Here he was on this cruising uh, uh, for conservation conference, sharing a room with Professor James Lindholm at CSUMB, right? He's photobombing here in the back of this, in his one of his, uh, Moss Landing Halloween costumes that he's been famous for. Right, and then finally, right, so Matt's thesis, as I'll tell you about, is studying the diet of cat sharks, right? Luckily, they don't look like this. Instead, he's studying these two species there. But I was kind of surprised that, you know, given his affinity for these other furry friends, that he didn't do his thesis work studying dogfish. But maybe that's because a few of the other shark lab students beat him to it. But all right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and we'll hear what he did for his thesis. Oof. Well, thank you, uh, Scott, for that introduction. And I'm sure my brother thanks you too for the introduction <laughs> as well. <laughs> He's famous now. <laughs> He's famous now. <clears throat> All right, hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you, friends, family, and, and the entire Moss Landing community for coming out today to uh, um, hear what I have to say, hear what I've been researching this, these past few years. Today, I'm gonna to take you through um, the trophic tendencies of two deep water cat sharks, Aperturus bruneus and Parmaturus uh, zanieris. So the uh, outline for today's talk will uh, go through um, both my sampling, uh, the introduction, um, my sampling methods for both stomach content and stable isotope analysis, and then um, the results in discussion. So I just want to point out now that I'm going to go objective by objective 
in results and discussion. So I'll present the results and then discuss it, present the result of objective two and then discuss it and so on and so on. But if I bore you to death and you wake up mid talk, you can always orient yourself to where we are in the, in the presentation by looking at the top bar up here. Additionally, for your convenience, I don't expect you to remember the scientific names of my sharks. So these drawings will appear in each of the slides that reference the respective species. Um, so if you're not so good with Latin, for all I care, you can call them the brown shark and the blue shark. Okay, so here's a little bit of background information. Community structure is shaped by a variety of environmental and positive environmental factors and positive and negative interactions between species. These interactions could be mutualism, where both individuals benefit from the interaction, such as these cleaning shrimp, uh, getting a free meal and the fish gets a free trip to the dentist. Could be commensalism, where a barnacle gets a free ride to do its filter feeding while the whale is unaffected by its presence. Predation, where one organism clearly gains and the other one loses. Or maybe competition, where the presence of both species um, decrease the chance of survivorship for uh, each other. The focus of my work has been on assessing the, the level of trophic overlap or competition that occurs between these two species. So let's talk about the types of competition. Well, so competition is the act of using a resource um, before another organism has the ability to. This pertains to sunlight or nutrients for primary producers or food and mates for consumers. Interference competition is the act active prevention of another organism from gaining access to a resource, like these two land dwelling things competing for a mate. Through this process, one individual is actively prevents the other from mating with the female. Exploitative competition is the use without direct interaction between the two organisms. The taller trees take up most of the sunlight before, the, before it has the ability to reach the forest floor where other photosynthetic organisms would like to use that resource as well. Competition for food can fall under both of these categories. By actively preventing another from consuming food is an example of interference competition. But if the initial organism comes along and eats the food before, um, before the second organism has the ability to, then it's considered to be exploitative. Competition has a very strong impact on the structure of communities. But one caveat for competition is that the, the resources that's in competition must be in short supply. When food is not in short supply, instead of assessing competition for dietary resources, we're looking at the degree of trophic overlap. So I, I conducted this, my study down um, in the deep sea and the deep sea is considered to be waters deeper than 200 meters. And due to the difficulty to access these ecosystems, there's an overall lack of life history studies compared to that of organisms that reside in the pelagic or coastal waters. Of the limited information that we have gathered about the deep sea, we know that it's a slow growing sensitive environment. Throughout time, we've exploited the areas that are most easily accessed. This started with the coastal waters, but then moved out to pelagic. And then um, as we advance our ability to, to extract um, oceanic resources, um, we have unlocked the ability to more easily exploit the deep sea. As the deep sea becomes more exploitable, the community structure will, will inevitably change, which is why it's necessary to gather information on species um, now. These life history studies are crucial to understanding the community structure and the impact that the removal of individuals from the community will have on the overall structure. Determining the trophic habits of a species can help determine where the species lies within the food web and help predict how community structure and resource allocation will change in response to population declines in an ecosystem that is vulnerable to change. So, oops. Um, Pentankid sharks are the most species family of sharks with over a hundred species that are found all over the world, but each species typically uh, only has a small geographic range. The species in this family have similar jaw morphologies and are of relative similar size, um, which often leads to their consumption of similar diets. Along the, United States, uh, along the United States West Coast, two species from this family are what I conducted my thesis on. I, just, I chose to study them due to the overlap in depth and geographic range in Central California. So first, uh -oh. so first 
uh, the brown cat shark. Um, so they possess this long slender body that maximizes their swimming efficiency. They have strong populations from Washington to Point Conception and are commonly found between depths of 400 and 900 meters. Previous diet studies have shown that they consume three main, main prey groups, shrimp, squid, and fishes. The second species, the second species is the file tail cat shark. Um, this is slightly smaller. It has a much more round uh, body that's not built for high speed pursuits. They can commonly be found between Point Reyes and San Diego, as well as between depths of 300 to 700 meters. Oops, sorry, I'm behind. Um, and then one previous diet study uh, found that they pr primarily consume shrimp, fishes, and crab. Okay, so as I said, Central California offers a unique, a unique opportunity to study the degree of competition or trophic overlap happening between these two species because of their overlapping depth and geographic ranges. As I stated, worldwide, sharks in this family uh, tend to feed on similar prey groups, so observing how these two species interact can help provide management insight to the largest family of sharks. To address this, uh, to address this, Sorry, my Zoom's lagging right now. Um, so to address this, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll determine what these species are eating, how their diets vary um, with different environmental and biological factors, determine the trophic overlap, uh, sorry, oops, I got ahead of myself, Deter determine the trophic level of each of these two species, and then also determine uh, the degree of trophic overlap. Samples will be collected, samples were collected on board uh, chartered commercial fishing vessels as part of the West Coast Ground Fish Bottom Trawl Survey conducted by the Fisheries Resource and Monitoring Division of NOAA. Samples were collected in summer and fall of 2017. The data collected on board are listed here. And just as a note, trawl composition is the proportionality of the two species to one another in the trawl net. So the samples were collected from the range of Pescadero Point down to San Luis Obispo using bottom trawl fishing gear. Samples were primarily taken from low relief soft bottom habitat between depths of 250 and 1200 meters. The whole sharks were frozen on board and brought back to Moss Landing Marine Labs for processing. I apologize if you get a little bit seasick watching this video, but if there's any future marine scientists out there, please know that their tolerance for seasickness is not a qualification uh, to do marine research. Typically, the first two days on these trips I are spent uh, hanging over the railing and drinking lots and lots of water, as I'll do now. <clears throat> so when back at the lab, dissections were con conducted with an army of CSUMB undergraduate volunteers. Um, the morphometric data were collected at the time of processing and uh, as well as stomachs and uh, vertebral white muscle tissue um, were refrozen for stomach content and stable isotope analysis respectively. So that brings up my two analysis methods. Um, so first stomach content analysis coined the last supper because it provides a, pre a brief snapshot of what the organism consumes over, uh, over the previous hours to days. But stable isotope analysis uh, looks at a consumer's tissue, and you can gain information about the diet of that organism over a longer scale through stable isotope analysis. As consumers feed, they start to incorporate the ratios of their prey into their own tissue. Thus, you are what you eat. And so these two analysis techniques should be, um, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, so the stable isotope ratios of somebody who eats like this every day are likely different than that of my lovely fiance, Allison's. Um, but these two methods should be, um, should be taken together because both have their deficiencies and they help bring together um, that idea of what the, what the organisms are eating. So how does stable isotope analysis give you information about what a consumer eats? Well, an element is defined by the number of protons and electrons it has but isotopes are naturally occurring forms of, the, of elements that are based on the number of neutrons. Isotopes with four neutrons will, have, will create heavier atoms. So as a consumer uses these atoms in metabolic processes, 
the lighter isotopes are more readily used, leaving the heavier ones behind in tissues. The change in the ratio of light to heavy isotopes left behind in the tissues is called isotopic fractionation. These ratios are denoted by the delta notation shown here. Okay, so switching back to stomach content analysis. Um, so my stomach content analysis consisted of thawing the stomachs and filtering um, them through a 50 micrometer sieve using DI water. Preodoms were sorted identify, and identified under a dissecting scope, and then they were photographed, weighed, and enumerated. <clears throat> Some stomachs were analyzed using two different methods, the number of individuals in the stomach and the total weight. If one set of data were, were analyzed, it could lead to a misrepresentation of the diet. For example, in stomach A, it looks like the domi dominant prey is fish, even though there are more shrimp in the stomach. This could lead to an overestimation of the importance of shrimp in stomach A if only number were considered. If only weight were considered, you would lose the significance of the number of shrimp in stomach B. The best method is to use both um, and, and compare the results. For the most part today, I'm gonna present, be presenting you on the weight data because they were fairly similar. Um, and if you're interested in uh, seeing some of the number data, feel free to check out my thesis in a few weeks. Okay, so here I will present the various dietary metrics that I used in my analyses. Prey accumulation curves were used to ensure enough stomachs were sampled for the stomach content analysis. The first metric are the, are the first metrics are the abundance metrics, which measured the average amount of prey in each stomach. This is your standard, add them all up and then divide by the number of stomachs. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit, bit of variability. So another method that's used is the prey specific metrics. This helps you get a better, understand, better understanding of the amount of prey in each stomach because it reduces the importance of zeros in the diet. Just because a prey species wasn't present in the stomach doesn't mean that the predator doesn't consume it at other times. So the prey specific abundances give a better representation of the overall importance or lack thereof of each prey in the diet. Next is frequency of occurrence, which is simply how often does that prey category show up in a, in, across all diets sampled. And then finally, PSIRI or prey specific index of relative importance is calculated by finding the average of the prey specific number and the prey specific weight, then multiplying it by the frequency of occurrence. PSIRI is the met, is, gives us a metric to compare across all prey taxa that incorporates both number and weight, like I mentioned on the slide before. <clears throat> so for stable isotope uh, analysis, I use white muscle tissue, and that gives us insight to the diet over a span of a few months to a year. The white muscle, so what that means is that the white muscle tissue can, can, contains an aggregate of all meals over that time span. Prey tissue found in the stomachs of the stomach content analysis were also used to identify the, the isotopic ratios of, the, of known prey items. So the tissues were rinsed in DI water um, to remove lipids, uh, sorry, rinsed in DI water to remove urea, rinsed in petroleum ether to remove lipids. And then Ambari was kind enough to let me bring all of my samples over to their lab and let me freeze dry them over there. Then we crushed them to a powder, crushed them to a powder, crushed them to a powder um, using a mod modified sawzall that you can see Mariah operating here. Um, that's the coolest thing about being a scientist is coming up with innovative ways to get a job done. And then finally, I sent my samples off to uh, the University of Mexico for spectrometry analysis. Okay, so in stable isotope land, different relative values mean different things. So low carbon values are typically associated with the open ocean, uh, open ocean sources of primary production, whereas enriched uh, typically uh, values become more enriched as they move closer to shore. Source carbon also varies vertically in the water column. Typically the surface water has lower delta, delta C uh, than, the, than the values from the seafloor. But keep in mind it, that in this study, 
uh, I, I sampled in the deep sea where there's no local primary production. For isotopic nitrogen, the most widely accepted interpretation is that species that are high on the food chain will have much higher de delta nitrogen values. Isotopic nitrogen increases by approximately uh, 3.4 .4 parts per mil with each trophic level. Also to a small degree, you, you also see these uh, species that live in a coastal environment have a higher delta, um, delta N and those in the open ocean have uh, a depleted delta N. Okay, so this is the reason that you're all here. <clears throat> I'm gonna walk you through the results objective by objective. And just to remind you, after each objective, I'm gonna discuss how these results fit into the bigger picture before moving on to the next objective. So first, objective one, what, uh, what, what do they eat? Remember that the brown icon is for the brown cat shark and the blue icon is for the bile tail cat shark. Here are some of the prey found in the stomachs. Um, the, prey, the prey found will be broken down into five main prey functional groups. The crab consisted of anamurin and brachyurine crab. Fishes had anchovies, juvenile hake, small rockfish, and others. Shrimp-like crustaceans were the hardest to identify because of their rapid digestion rates and lack of hard parts. This group was the most diverse, but um, the most dominant prey item in this, in this category was the Pacific flash shrimp shown at the top of this, uh, of this window. And then finally, the squid were actually the easiest to identify because each species has a unique beak. Um, you can see three out of the six that were found in this study. The fifth category is pyrosome, which is not shown here, but we'll talk about them in a few slides. All right, so first up, what does the brown cat shark eat? So at the bottom are the 10, 10 uh, identified, excuse me, uh, 10 identified prey observed in the stomachs broken down into those five functional groups. Um, and that the colors are gonna remain constant throughout the presentation. So when looking at the brown cat shark by number, we see that squid is the most dominant prey category. This was driven by the slow digestion time and high identification rate of the squid beaks. But squid weeks don't weigh very much. So when we're looking at the weight data, the squid become a little less important. We see that the fishes become the more important prey category by weight. But remember, we're, we're gonna uh, use PSIRI to compare both of these uh, analysis methods. So taking a look at the PSIRI over here, um, you see that, the, that the, the values for fishes, shrimp, and squid are more or less uniformly packed. So, oops. So when, when asking the question, what does the brown cat shark eat? A combination of shrimp, squid, and fishes. The file tail cat shark, um, oh, sorry. Pyrosomes were only found in the stomachs of the file tail cat sharks. So pyrosomes are filter feeding colonial tunicates um, and they weren't, they weren't very important. Um, they weren't a very important prey in this, in this study. By number, you can see that the file tails feed heavily on shrimp, which was also true for the weight data. So when you look at the PSIRI, you see a uh, a disproportional amount of importance placed on shrimp. So when you ask the question, what does the file tail cat shark eat? Well, primarily shrimp. So here's an isotopic biplot. The values for carbon are on the x-axis and the values for nit nitrogen are on the y. So remember that carbon is an indication of the source primary production where nitrogen indica indicates trophic level. So this shows the average stable isotopic values with the error bars for both of, both of the two sharks study, uh, that, I, that I studied for my thesis. Also pictured here are the isotopic prey values for the prey found in the stomachs of the sharks. But what I want you to take away from this slide is that you'll notice that there's the ex expected 3.4 parts per mil increase um, between trophic levels. So to recap this objective, 
We observed that the brown, shark, brown cat shark feeds primarily on squid, fishes, and shrimp. The PSIRI for these three prey functional groups are much more closely packed than the same three prey groups than the filetail cat shark. We see a single strong association for shrimp to the filetail, for the filetail. This leads us to classify the brown cat shark as having a generalist feeding strategy, whereas the filetail cat shark has more of a preferential or specialized feeding strategy. So these two pandas also have two different feeding strategies. The, the panda on the right specializes uh, in consuming bamboo and the one on the left kind of eats whatever it can get its grimy mitts on. Um, keep in mind that this these are not discrete bins, but rather a spectrum between the two types of feeding strategies where species can occupy ranges on the spectrum. Okay, so to address which biological and environmental factors cause variability in the diet of each species, I used a permanova on the fourth root transformed number and weight data. This multivariate analysis identifies which factors cause significant differences between the diet which is a multivariate response factor. I excluded maturity from these analyses because it's significantly co-varied with total length. And remember, so for this part of the talk, I'm just gonna focus on the weight data um, because between the number and weight, they're, they, the, the results were fairly similar. And like I said before, if you're interested in the, that number data, feel free to check out my thesis in a few weeks. Okay, so. The first, uh, so the permanova for apres oh, sorry, um, uh, for the brown cat shark can be seen down at the bottom here. The first factor that the permanova produced was season. Because season is a categorical variable, we visualize it using this stacked bar plot here. On the x-axis, we have season and proportional diet composition by weight on the y-axis. So the stacked bar plot shows that during the summer, brown cat sharks feed more heavily on shrimp but in the fall, that diet has shifted to more of a fish-based diet. So just remember, brown cat shark, shrimp in the summer, fish in the fall. The second factor that the permanova produced was total length. Because total length is a continuous variable, we use a series of linear, uh, of linear regressions to visualize these trends. The x-axis here moved from smaller to larger sharks, and the y-axis is still proportional weight by diet. Oh, sorry, proportional diet by weight. Um, so the most dramatic trend that we saw was with the fishes. Fishes were rarely found in stomachs of smaller sharks, but much more common in the large sharks. Small sharks tended to re rely more heavily upon shrimp and squid. So large sharks consume fishes, small sharks consume uh, shrimp and squid. The third factor was latitude and we saw some similar trends. So on the x-axis here, we have latitude moving from south to north. And as we increase latitude, the proportion of fish in the diet also increased. But to account for that increase, we saw a proportional uh, sh decrease um, of shrimp as, as latitude increased. So we had fishes in the north and shrimp in the, in the south. <clears throat> so switching gears to the file tail cat shark, the diet of the file tail cat shark only varied with two, uh, two factors, season and total length. Remember, shrimp was the largest contributor to diet um, like across the board. And we've now added a fifth category, pyrosomes. Again, so to orient you to this plot, um, season is on the x-axis and we have the weight on the y. But what you should see here is that both seasons were still heavily dominated by shrimp. But in the fall season, uh, the file tails consume more fishes and squid. So uh, in the summer, uh, shrimp were dom dominant. In the fall, uh, fish and squid uh, made, made a bit of an increase. The second factor was total length. Again, regressions because these are continuous, this is a continuous variable. Um, and the x-axis is total length increasing. So small on the smaller sharks on the left, larger sharks on the right. And overall, you see that shrimp is still very high across all size classes. But we see a dramatic decrease in squid as sharks get larger. And an overall downward trend for the... Did I say that backwards? 
As sharks get as sharks get larger, we see an increase in the squid. My my apologies. Um, and then we uh, for the other two dominant prey categories, fishes and shrimp, you see a downward trend. So large sharks are consuming more squid, and small sharks are consuming more. Um, now I'm getting in my head. <laughs> so large sharks consume more squid and smaller sharks are, are consuming more shrimp and fishes. So in summary, we see that season and total length affect the diet along with latitudinal differences affecting the brown cat shark. So let's dive in um, to those three um, factors. So the most common factors, the, the most common factors for these three species were season, latitude, and total length. For the brown cat shark, we uh, for actually for both both species by season, shrimp were the most uh, common prey item during the summer season, and then shifts to other diet in the in the uh, in the fall. We saw much higher proportions of fish in the north and shrimp in the southern part of it the uh, of the study area, and then. Um, overall, small sharks eat more shrimp-like crustaceans, and larger sharks are switching to mo more mobile prey like fishes and squid. Okay, so I also used permanovas to uh, test the test the factors using my stable isotope analysis. So we're back to the brown cat shark here, and you can see the significant model that this permanova produced down at the bottom. So the first. Um, so there, the so because these um, these uh, uh, these isotopes are continuous variables. Uh, sorry, because total length is a continuous variable, we're using a regression to visualize the trends. So carbon is going to be on the top, and nitrogen is going to be on the bottom. the The y-axis is the isotopic values for each of the two um, uh, ratios. There's a significant downward trend for carbon, which means that these species are likely feeding in different habitats throughout their life. And as expected, there's a significant increase in the nitrogen values. As, just, as, as I discussed earlier, um, there's about a 3.4 parts per mil increase uh, between trophic levels. And so as sharks get larger, they start consuming um, prey that is higher on the food chain. So the takeaway here is that we see a decrease for large sharks in carbon and an increase in nitrogen. The second factor is, uh, is, is latitude. The same orientation is on the previous slide, except now on the x-axis, we have latitude, which uh, goes from south on the left to north on the right. Both carbon and nitrogen showed increasing trends from south to north, but only the nitrogen values were significant. So sharks in the north were feeding at a higher trophic level than in the south. And there's an, but there's an enriched source of carbon, there's an enriched carbon signature in the north. So the takeaway is no change in carbon, but an increase in nitrogen. Finally, sex was a significant factor because sex is a categorical variable. We have to visualize it a bit differently. I used, a, I used cyber to visualize these differences, which is stable isotope um, Bayesian ellipses in R. So Cyber takes the isotopic values for carbon and nitrogen and plots them on a bi bivariate plane. So each of the little dots that you see there are an individual shark. Cyber overlays a 95% confidence interval ellipse for each species to kind of show you where, where each, uh, not each species, for each sex. So that kind of shows you where each of this two, uh, the two sexes are feeding. So here you see a significant overlap between the two sexes but the ellipses for male is stretched on the y-axis, which represents nitrogen. So remember, nitrogen is an indication of trophic levels. So we say that the males are feeding on, on prey that is higher on the food chain. The standard ellipse area plot on the right shows you that males have a much larger ellipse because they fall out higher on the y-axis. So because they're higher on the y-axis, this represents a larger trophic niche. But the males also have a larger icon here, which represents more inter-individual variability. So the takeaway from this slide is that males are feeding at a higher trophic level. Okay. The second factor was uh, total length. Oh, sorry. I'm switching now to um, the file tail cat shark. 
So the, the model can be seen down at the bottom of your slide. That was annoying. Um, so the first, the first uh, factor was total length, but it did not significantly vary with, co uh, vary with carbon. The only change was seen in the nitrogen, which again makes sense because the larger sharks are feeding at a higher trophic level. <clears throat> Both carbon and nitrogen increased as latitude increased, so the northern end of the range had an enriched source of carbon and nitrogen signature. And then finally, um, season influenced isotopic values in the file tail. Again, the cyber plot shows the 95% confidence interval ellipses. So the difference between summer and fall is primarily dr driven by the differences in the carbon values on the x axis. Remember that carbon values are uh, carbon signatures indicate the differences in the base of the food web or what photosynth what photosynthesizers are fixing carbon for use in the food chain. We are seeing that the two seasons are producing different carbon signatures. From the standard ellipse plot, standard ellipse area plot, you see about the same size um, same size ellipse. However, the the group for the summer is a bit more, uh, has a bit more variability between individuals. So the takeaway is that the differences, there's differences by season uh, for carbon. So once again, you can see that the latitude and total length were the, were the two factors that most significantly affected uh, in, uh, caused variation in the diet, just as we saw in the stomach content analysis. So let's recap what we saw for those two factors. The most important trend for nitrogen was with uh, for total length was was with nitrogen, as nitrogen in, as total length increased, nitrogen increased, and this demonstrates what we already know: larger sharks are feeding on higher trophic level prey. The most notable trend that we saw for latitude was an enriched source of carbon at higher latitudes, and really no change in the trophic level that sharks were feeding at over the sample sampling range. So now let's discuss this variability a bit. Um, so. There's three, there are three main factors that we saw across the stomach content and stable isotope analysis that I'll address here. So that's latitude, season, and total length. The sampling area can be split into two geographic ranges, Monterey Bay and Big Sur uh, in, in the north, and San Luis Obispo in the south. <clears throat> so as you can see, the two ranges, uh, the two regions can be characterized by two very different habitat structures. In the north, we see an expansive canyon system that provides high relief habitat, whereas down in San Luis Obispo, there's a lot of shallow, low relief, soft bottom habitat. This affects the diet of sharks through two mechanisms. Up in the north, the canyons provide structure that enhances water mass exchange between the surface and the deep sea. This is why we saw an enriched source of carbon values in the north, where, the, where there's much more connectivity to the coastal systems where carbon is typically enriched. In the south, there's much less mixing. So there's a depletion of carbon, which is a signature of the benthic environment. The second reason is due to exposed rocky reefs in the north. Exposed rock has been shown to be an oasis of, uh, of underwater, underwater life. This creates a suitable habitat for larger organisms like fishes. This is why we saw a higher proportion of fish in the north and more invertebrates in the south. Oops, I am behind. So higher sea in the north, lower sea in the south, um, and then fishes and inverts. Okay, so the second, uh, the second factor, there's in, in, in central California, there's three distinct oceanographic seasons for which I sampled during two of them. The first up is the upwelling season. Upwelling in California happens when strong southward winds push surface water offshore, which is replaced by nutrient rich deep water. These nutrients, at the surface allow primary producers to create a strong base for the, of the food chain. The second is the ocean current season when the southerly winds relax, which allows the California current to move closer to shore, which carries less nutrients than the waters of the deep. But anybody who travels to Monterey know there's, there's a much bigger season at play here. And that's whale watching season. Now, I know what you're thinking, like, Matt, why do you care about whale watching season? But think about why the whales are here between March and June. Are you thinking or are you looking at the meme? Should be thinking. 
Yeah. So it's the, the reason is upwelling season brings all that deep nutrient rich water to the surface, which allows krill and other shrimp like crustaceans to explode. This is why we saw a higher proportion of shrimp consumed in the summer than when shrimp were less abundant in the fall. We saw them switch to the sharks switch to other prey items like fishes and squid. We didn't see much of a different uh, difference in the isotopic data because the long temporal scare, scale of stable isotope analysis made it hard to detect seasonal changes in the diet. And finally, with total length, I don't feel like I need to beat a dead horse. So I'm going to let Michael Scott explain this one while I take some water. OK, so on to objective three. So my third objective is quite simple. I wanted to, to, to determine what trophic level these sharks are feeding at. And I did this with both the stomach content and the stable isotope analysis. So I calculated these trophic, uh, trophic levels shown here on the table for both the stomach content and stable isotope analysis for both species. I, collect, I, I calculated these with data that I collected for both, both uh, analysis techniques. So I determined that both of these sharks were approximately between 3.5 and 4. Um, the trophic level for file tail was slightly lower than the brown, uh, brown cat shark due to the high importance of shrimp in the diet, which uh, has a lower trophic level than fishes and squid. This would classify these two sharks as top predators, but not to be considered apex predators. OK, so let's wrap it all up with objective four. So objective four is looking at the trophic overlap and the potential co for competition. So trophic overlap describes the similarity or dissimilarity in the diet between the two species. So what we saw with the stomach content data is exactly what we saw back in objective one. The brown cat shark feeds more uniformly on fi a squid, fishes, and shrimp, but the file tail cat shark feeds primarily on shrimp. Although they have different diet structure and feeding strategies, they still feed largely on the same three prey categories, which means there's significant overlap between the two species. So here, what you're looking at is an NMDS plot um, <clears throat> that shows the trophic niche of both species. What you should focus on here is that the prey groups, um, the prey groups that fall more closely to the centroid of the ellipse, which represents the trophic niche of, uh, of each of the two species, um, are more important to that, to that predator. So if you look at where shrimp is, it falls really, really close to the centroid of the, of the file tail cat sharks uh, trophic niche. So that's because shrimp are the more important prey for the file tail. To quantify how much these dietary niches overlap, we use the Zaret and Ran uh, dietary overlap coefficient. Overlap is considered to be significant when the coefficient is above 0 0.6, which both the number and weight are. So you can visualize, you can visually see that with these overlapping ellipses that represent the trophic niche region. In terms of stable isotope analysis, we see the same pattern. Remember that the cyber plots show, uh, have the isotopic, uh, the cyber plots have the, the isotopic values for each shark on a bivariate plane. So each little, each little dot here is an individual shark uh, from the two species. So as you can see, uh, oh, sorry, carbon is, remember, is the source of primary production and nitrogen indicates the trophic level. And as you can see, the trophic niche size of the brown cat shark is much larger and nearly encompasses the trophic niche of the file tail. The standard ellipse plot shows that as well. So just remember that because this icon is higher on the y-axis, this means that Aperturus has a larger uh, trophic niche and Parmaturus has a smaller trophic niche. Now the icon here being bigger than the icon of Parmaturus indicates that Aperturus brunius has more inter-individual variability between uh, members of the species. A fairly new technique called niche rover helps us quantify the niche ranges of both species. So niche rover generates 1,000 random projections of cyber ellipses. So this, 
I've gotten a few comments on this that looks says it looks like a five-year-old drew this. So what it is, is there's a thousand niche regions that are plotted for both species here. So, but keep in mind that the axes are flipped. So nitrogen, this is just, nitrogen is on the, on the, um, on the X axis and carbon is on the Y. But what these, a thousand, the, these thousand random projections do, it creates a single dimension, dimensional density plot to show you the overlap between the two species. So here you can see that the two species are significantly overlapping in terms of their nitrogen values. But they're, more of, they're much more dissimilar in terms of their carbon. So the takeaway from here is that the carbon is dissimilar, but the nitrogen shows, shows high overlap. The coolest part about niche rover is that it gives us a probabilistic measure for the amount of overlap between the two species. As you saw, the niche region for brown was much larger and nearly encompassed the file tails. So if we randomly selected an individual from the brown cat sharks, there would be between a 30 and 44% chance that it would fall into the niche region of Parmaturus. And that's because the niche region was much bigger. But if we randomly selected an individual from the file tails, there would be between an 81 and 94% chance of that, falling, that, that individual falling into the trophic niche region of the brown cat shark. So both analysis techniques showed us that there's significant overlap between the two species. So, Cool, they overlap. Why? Who cares, right? Um, so remember that in order for competition to be acting upon these two species, the one main assumption is that resources must be limiting. If resources not, if resources, ugh, if resources are limiting, we have two options to consider. Scenario one: we assume that the file tail cat shark is the stronger competitor. This means that the file tail is able to consume the food it wants in the presence of the brown cat shark. And this forces the brown cat shark to find less desirable prey to sustain itself. So this is much like the study that Gauss did in 1934 on paramecium. One species survivorship was not affected by the presence of the other and continued to live its own life. Um, the other was not able to consume its desired prey and ultimately could not exist in the presence of the stronger competitor. Scenario two assumes that the brown cat shark is the stronger competitor because it has the larger trophic niche. This means that the brown cat shark is able to feed as it pleases and the file tail cat shark is forced into a smaller trophic niche to consume prey that is not in the primary foraging habitat of the brown cat shark. So this is much like, this, uh, this can be seen in Connell's exclusion experiment with the barnacles in the inner tidal. Regardless of whether or not the um, weaker competitor was present, the stronger competitor occupied the same fundamental niche. So, so the fundamental niche and the realized niche were the same. But when the roles were reversed, this is the fundamental niche of th Thamelis. And so when Balanus isn't there, it gets to expand its range to, to its happy zone. But Balanus being the stronger competitor forces it into a smaller uh, realized niche. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw a bonus scenario at you. <clears throat> uh, when resources aren't limiting, that means that resources have been partitioned by both species and the species are implementing op optimal foraging theory and are foraging in a way that maximizes their net energy gain. In other words, the buffet is open and you're free to feed on whatever you'd like. Much like this jabroni here. But in all seriousness, ultimately it's unknown which scenario is at play here. And in order to determine which scenario is likely present, we would need to construct uh, an experimental exclusion study just like Connell did with the barnacles in the inner tidal. But due to logistical challenges of studying the deep sea, this is nearly impossible unless maybe we enlist the help of the Atlanteans. Um, but I guess if Aquaman isn't available, my advisor, Scott Hamilton, may be of some use. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to wrap up this presentation with some co conclusions and uh, some food for thought. Did you get it? <laughs> I see one camera on, Scott's laughing, so joke landed. Um, 
In the deep sea of central California resides an assemblage of an elasma brink, uh, seven elasma brink predators. Now that this study is complete, the diet for all seven species have asset, been assessed in the same geographic range. What we see is the, these seven species have partitioned themselves into three functional groups. The brown cat shark and squalus implement a generalist feeding strategy and place importance on their, in their diet on shrimp, squid, and fishes uniformly. The file tail and Bathyraja kinkadi place a dispropor disproportional amount of uh, importance on shrimp, shrimp-like crustaceans relative, the other, relative to the other prey that are consumed. And finally, the three skates in the middle also off, uh, implement a generalist feeding strategy, but their focus is more on crab, shrimp, and fishes. So once again, as we begin to unlock the riches of the deep sea, we need to understand that this ecosystem is a slow growing delicate system. Disturbances could have a disproportional effect on the organisms that reside there. Knowledge like this study and other life history studies are crucial to the implementation of ecosystem based fisheries management. These two species play an important role as a top predator as an abundant top predator in the deep sea ecosystem. Ecosystem based fisheries management looks at the health of the ecosystem as a whole and not just a few economically important species. But in order to understand, uh, in order for ecosystem um, based fisheries management to be successful, it requires a greater understanding of the life history studies of all species that reside in that ecosystem, not just a chosen few. So knowledge on the trophic ecology of Apristeris brunius and Parmaturus zanieris brings us one step closer to fully understanding the deep sea ecosystem off the coast of central California and how future disturbances uh, will affect it. So thank you all for coming, um, but I'd like to take just a few more minutes of your time uh, to acknowledge the people that really made this, this, uh, this thesis possible. So first, Dr. Scott Hamilton, um, I would like to thank you for taking me in as an orphaned grad student when you already had so many students in, in your lab. But really quickly did I find out what the ichthyology lab was all about. Um, so here I decided to send two Smirnoff ices down to Catalina with one of, uh, one of my lab mates and uh, ice Scott within a week of being in his lab. And he's still, he's still here and presented for me or my brother uh, for, for his thesis defense. But seriously, Scott, thank you for always being available to chat. I sent him an email one day and he got out of the water and called me still salty on his way home. He's without a doubt the person that I, I can't thank enough for this thesis. But most importantly, thank you for pushing me to do more and become more, become the best scientist that I possibly could. Um, <clears throat> Gita, thank you for being so uplifting. Um, thank you for all of the, uh, the feedback that you always provided me um, and also letting me hang out in your lab with Sharon all the time. Um, Keith, uh, Boz, I just, I can't get over the fact that you never put us on a survey leg together. Um, the only person that I was, ne was, was not on a leg with was you. Um, but thank you so much for being that, that go-to uh, person. Whenever I had a question, um, I could just text you and, and you'd get back to me uh, really quickly. And I love our Zoom meetings because um, it's what limited social interaction that I've had over the past year, you know? Okay, I'd also like to thank all of the fishing vessels that helped me uh, collect my thesis, as well as the entire West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl team. Um, so all of all of this thesis wouldn't be possible without you, because I don't have nearly enough money to to get out to the deep sea and collect these samples myself. Um, the Ichthyology Lab has always been a huge support for providing feedback. Um, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the Haddock Lab at Embari and Lynn for always taking time for walking me back to the freeze dryer and letting me use that um, whenever I could. And I had to do like four or five trips over there just to get all my samples freeze dried. Sharon, thank you for putting up with me as a roommate when I was at my most stressed. You were always happy to talk through interpretations of stable isotope 
uh, analysis with me and uh, Bun Buns quickly became Miska's best friend. Um, so the MLML community is truly one of a kind. Um, we all know the rigors as grad students in this program, we all know the rigors um, and it surpasses in my opinion, non-biased or anything, uh, surpasses that of the of many other uh, grad programs around the country. So being thrown into this community where the best of the best uh, are, are my peers really helped bring out the best in all of us. A large reason why like Moss Landing Marine Lab graduates are so successful is because of the amazing support system that we have here. Tara, I can't, I can't say enough. You've been the rock for all of us grad students. You help us solve problems in any way that you can. James, Billy, and Chris, James, Billy, Chris, and Gary, uh, shop guys, like always there to help, not help us with whatever our experiment needs. Michelle was always a smiling face that would just walk down the hall and ask me how, how my day was. Jocelyn, this lab would not run without you. IT, I know that you're like way overtaxed right now with the COVID and whatnot. Um, so I appreciate all the work that you guys do. Katie and the library staff, thanks for getting me all of my articles that I needed over the pandemic. And uh, Jim and Ivano, thank you for creating like this, this great Moss Landing graduate program. And finally, Dr. Holly Swift, thank you for always being available for answering any statistical question that I've had. Um, and you'll also know that she is the wonderful artist behind these, these, uh, uh, these figure, these icons that you saw throughout the presentation. So I'd like to fun, uh, thank my funding sources um, before, uh, so I, the, as Scott said, the, um, the Myers Grant, California Sea Grant, um, UROC and the Coast Scholars and Training Program. Um, this next person really means a whole lot to me. Um, hold on, I gotta get the other video playing too. As you can see, he is just without a doubt the best dancer that you've ever seen. Um, so Dr. James Lindholm, thank you for taking a chance on me when I was a uh, lost and uh, directionless undergrad um, and give, showing me um, what I could be as a researcher. Um, you've really just driven me to be the best researcher that I possibly can. And you've really, I've really developed a sincere friendship with you. Okay, my screen went black. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, uh, so these three wonderful scientists, what would I do without you? This project wouldn't have been possible without Charlotte, Jenny, and Mariah. Um, Jenny, uh, sorry, Charlotte, you're my stomach dissection master. There's just no doubt about it. Jenny, you rock the crap out of, of the dissecting scope and stable isotope stuff, except when you're throwing my samples all over the benthic lab. Um, but that's a story for another time. And Mariah, thank you so much for um, keeping me organized and you were so crucial to all of my stable isotope stuff. While these three certainly helped speed up my efficiency, they also wasted a lot of time. <laughs> so, yeah, let me get these videos playing. Um, so first, this, this, they, I don't know, we lost like 45 minutes one day because they saw a shrimp in my diet that, um, that looked like Sid from Ice Age. And so we had to have a 40, 40 minute detour uh, as we compared sh uh, Sid the shrimp to Sid the sloth. Um, Jenny always has weird things on her head. And I don't know, Jenny doesn't know how to work a shovel either because she decides to dig a hole with her hands instead. Um, Mariah and Jenny like to clean the floor uh, with their bodies as opposed to paper towels. And this video is holds dear to my heart um, the most impressive thing that these three did for me was teach me how to speak like a young person. So this is a video of Charlotte teaching me what the word yeet means. Um, I still have no idea what, what it means. So maybe that was not the proper thing to say during a thesis defense. I still have no idea. Okay, so now let's talk about the brohort. So this, this little group started in subtitle um, and there's so many stories that the four of us have. Um, whether it's Steven shouting, there's a huge wave coming and I don't think that wave even touched my ankles um, or leaving 
when we went lobster diving, we just left Laurel behind in the surf and all we hear from like 40, 40 yards away was, guys, don't leave me. So I truly appreciate uh, the three of you as well as all of my um, um, fellow cohort members. And let's be honest, the Brohort is the best cohort Moss Landing Marine Labs has ever seen. So thanks for keeping me sane and being the best group of friends that I could ever possibly have wished for. And then finally, um, I know you already saw a picture of him once, but my brother, here, my brother and sister are here again. Uh, thank you for being that wonderful support system. Um, and always, you're essentially my best friends. Uh, Mom and dad, thank you for always giving me the opportunities to do exactly what I want with my life. And thank you, Allison, for, uh, I know this, these, Allison's also finishing up her thesis too. And so, uh, our, our house can be quite intolerable at times with uh, both of our stresses, but thank you for always loving me and the best two uh, support systems ever, Miska and Riley, um, you guys are, are the best. Um, so thank you all for, for coming today. And with that, I'll let you look at this ugly cat shark and I'll take any of your, any of your questions. Great job, Matt. That was a really nice talk. Really fun. All right, we are open for questions. Would anyone like to ask Matt a question? Oh, no. Let's make him squirm a little bit. Yeah, that'll be fun. I don't even know who's here. Oh, I see Kenneth holding his hand up. Kenneth, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, if possible. Yeah, well, you're speaking, go for it. All right, well, Matt, awesome job. Really uh, enjoyed that, uh, that talk. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you a, a question about your file tail. Um, you seem to show um, male uh, feeding preference for organisms higher on the food chain than the female. So that would argue for some sexual uh, difference um, also between those species. And I was wondering if there was a morphometric difference between those sexes that could explain this uh, change in feeding strategy. So there's not, with that species, there's not. Um, they're, um, they're very similar in size um, and the research, the, the publications show that they don't sexually segregate. Um, sex uh, was a very, wasn't common, right? It was only in that, in the stable isotope data for, for that one species. Okay. Um, and due to the longer temporal range, I, I don't really have an explanation as to why those isotopic values were different. Um, but for that species, they are about the same size and they don't, uh, Previous literature says that they don't sexually segregate. Okay, and just one other comment. Um, I know this is a uh, what's uh, known as a culminating experience for you, but it is a culminating culminating experience for all of us who have been touched by you. And I want to thank you for being in my class and contributing so productively to that. So I think I got as much. Um, from you as maybe you did from us. And I wanna, wanna thank you for that. I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough, Kenneth, for, for being the, the, the professor that you, that you are. And I, I appreciate the, the comment and it's well received and I feel the same way about you. Well, I think all the faculty feel this way. So <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Kenneth. All right. Thanks, uh -oh. Kenneth. Okay. I see the oh, you gonna go off? Yeah. What? James, James, James Lindholm, you raised your hand next. So your turn. Uh oh, hang on. <laughs> hang on a second. Do you hear me? We hear you, yep. All right. Matt, excellent work. That was a really fantastic presentation in terms of content and accessibility in a scientific communication communication context. Really well done. Slides were impressive. Um, so I had a couple questions. I also wanted to second, of course, Kenneth's comments um, and in particular point to those seven days where I got to see that posture on the bed every single day that was I got a chance to see that every day for seven days and that 
it's burned in my mind for all eternity. You're um, welcome. So the question I have is, uh, you start off the presentation talking about the relatively small ambits of the catch arcs, right? That they're not covering much territory. Right. Um, and so I was wondering if you were considered where does vary where does spatial variability in the patchiness of the prey captured by your model? I mean, latitudinally, I guess you'd see some of it, but have you thought about that? I was thinking about the pyrosomes in particular too, because they're so they're so patchy. What do you what do you think about that? I don't I don't know if it's if, if it's a latitudinal difference. I think it was more driven by the habitat structure. Um, and then latitude was just a proxy for for the two different habitats that we saw. Um, but yeah, over the larger scope of the of the um, of the expanse of the species, um, the, the the two previous studies showed different diets that I, that I saw. Um, and so there's likely variability in the diet um, due to latitude, um, but more driven by prey abundance um, because the prey that you see up in Washington aren't the same prey that we're seeing down here or down in Southern California. So that same latitudinal gradient in prey is likely driving the differences in the, um, in the uh, diet of the sharks on a large scale but on a, on a more micro scale, it's likely due to the, um, the habitat structure. Cool, thank you. All right, Laurel, you're up. Hey Matt, good job. Thanks, Thanks for bringing up a, a very traumatic night for me <laughs> when I almost got washed out to sea. <laughs> um, so you I was curious. In the sea. You were like five feet from the shore. <laughs> 20 feet. Anyways, um, I was curious if you included year as um, a factor in your permanova, or what years did you collect between? I only collected in one year. So I only collected oh, okay. in summer and fall of 2017. Oh, I see. Okay. In that case, never mind. Thanks, Laurel. Any other questions for Matt? Well, I'll ask you a question then while waiting to see if anyone else has a question, right? So at the end of your discussion, right, you laid out kind of three different scenarios for what might be happening. Each species might be the top competitor, or maybe there's just so much prey out there that it doesn't really matter. And so I guess my question is, what do you think is actually happening for these species? Do you think there's a place in time where the prey may be uh, restricted enough that they are actively competing, or do you think their prey is just so abundant relative to you know, their abundance in the deep sea that it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm gonna go with the, the second one, but like I said before, I, I don't have a definitive answer to that. Um, but based off, of, um, based off of what I've seen, I believe that the third scenario is at play here um, where they are abundant and there is no, there's no competition acting on the two species. Um, because if you look at the if you look at the um, the body structure of both sharks, um, the the long slender body of Apristurus enables it to have more swimming efficiency, which is better suited for capturing more mobile prey like the fishes and squid. Uh, whereas that that round flabby body of Parmaturus um, probably makes it uh, a more uh, it's more suitable for capturing shrimp. Um, and so I feel like they've partitioned these resources based off of their, um, based off of their, um, net, their net energy gain. Great. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? Or we're going to let them off easy. All right. So what I'll do now, my dog is saying congrats. Um, I, in a second, I will allow everybody to unmute themselves so they can tell Matt congratulations. And then we'll ask everybody except for Matt's committee members to leave. And we're going to have a small additional conversation uh, with Matt. So let me see if I can do this. All right. So everyone, I think, can now unmute themselves if you want to tell Matt congratulations and good job. Congratulations. Good job. Awesome. Fantastic. Good job, Matt. Good job.